The year was 1987, and little did we know, Squaresoft was about to change the game forever. Okay, well, maybe I wasn't alive then, but since the day I was born, I knew my purpose in life was to be a Final Fantasy fan. The game that spawned the landmark franchise is, by default, important and basically can't be criticized. Many have debated the origin of the cryptid-like name of the series, but with a bit of research, I was able to lay this mystery to rest. In this interview with series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi, he says the following, when it came down to making the game that would be our last-ditch effort to save our company, we knew the name would really have to stick out, really stand the test of time. So what we did was pull out a dartboard full of names. Stuff like The Bouncer, Romancing Saga, Minstrel Song, Xeno Gears, you know, names that would never catch on. Before we started chucking tomahawks at the board, I had Kuazu or Shots. Well, when we woke up the next day, we didn't remember anything. The office was trashed, and there was just one piece of paper on the floor that read he he hoo hoo lol final fantasy tee he and the rest is history wait a second i don't think he actually said that oh shit i hope i don't get sued for slander now final fantasy needs very little introduction you know about it i know about it hell everybody knows about it even your parents know about final fantasy Probably because they both have the hots for Balthier. Can you blame them? While the series is known for many things, one that always stuck out to me in particular was how it popularized the job class system. This gameplay system has withstood the test of time, being present in several of the most beloved mainline and spin-off entries, its identity arguably existing in every single game. So, here I am, starting a new series that'll attempt to cover every job system Final Fantasy title. But why just the job system games, you ask? I don't know. I like them. And, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. This franchise has been talked to death on the internet. So if you want to stand out, you need a gimmick. Tis YouTube and the algorithm that wrong you, not I. Also, before you say anything, I know FF1 doesn't technically count, but the job system's DNA started forming here, so we gotta pay our respects. Let's start from the beginning. Strap in and welcome to Getting a Job, a Final Fantasy Retrospective. Before we dive into the meat of FF1, it's worth noting that this game has been remade a billion times. Square gonna square. That meant I had plenty of options to choose from, and while I'm sure FF1 heads get real passionate about their preferred version, we'll be playing the recently released Pixel Remaster. Widescreen footage and a nice pixel aesthetic? Yes, please. And I mean, NES definitely wasn't an option. Don't get me wrong, I respect those who managed to push through that, but it's far too old and stinky for me. When the other options were not that bad, nerfed by GBA sound chip, and RPG maker looking ass, it was a no brainer. For the three early job system FF games, we will be using the Pixel Remasters, and I'll get into any changes and differences that I notice if I feel like I need to. But for now, let's jump in. When you start a new game, you get to create four characters from a combination of available jobs. These are Warrior, Thief, Monk, Red Mage, White Mage, and Vivi. Choose carefully though, because you're locked into this party for your entire playthrough. So I decided to stay traditional this first time through, picking a warrior named Jack. Can you tell I started this project before the marketing team of FF Origin revealed that Jack was Garland? It's like a hunger, a thirst. A monk named Scrungus, a white mage named Hubert, and a VV named Craig. Oh, Craig, you're going to be our buffiest support boy. In Final Fantasy I, the world's balance was maintained by four elemental crystals. Four fiends one day showed up to corrupt the crystals and cast the world into chaos. However, there was a prophecy stating that when needed the most, four warriors of light would appear to save the world. And you do. In very typical fantasy RPG fashion, you roll up into town and go chat up the nearest monarch to see what's up. Your Majesty, 
We four heroes of light have arrived, crystals in hand. What ask you of us? Listen, that douchebag Garland who lives across the street keeps having the loudest parties. I can't sleep, and the HOA won't do shit about it. I don't even know what I pay them for. Go tell him to quiet down. Uh, um, I had hoped we would discuss more pressing matters, like the kidnapping of Princess Sarah or the elemental unbalance. Hey, she went over to party with that Garland guy. She's too good for him. Another reason to kick his ass. <sighs> Methinks this is going to be a tad creatively bankrupt. <laughs> oh, buddy, you don't know the half of it. It's not really too hard to find him. Just stock up on some gear and head north. The bridge that would take you out of the starting area is destroyed, so you're pretty much railroaded on where you need to go. March right through the front door of the Chaos Shrine, and there he is, just kind of chillin'. Garland's armor set and theme might be iconic, but he's a glorified jobber, so you kick his ass into a whole other era. You return the princess to Cornelia and are told to set off across the land to fix the crystals and save the world. Your quest is ready to begin. But not before stopping and taking in the excellent desktop wallpaper like Vista. Final Fantasy 1 isn't exactly what I'd call a guide game because if I did, I'd be jumped by the Get Good Gang. I'll instead call it a bit of an aimless wanderer game. You have your vague goal, restore the crystals, and that's it. You'll have to rely on NPCs to point you in the right direction, and for an 80s game, I'll admit, I've played far more obtuse ones. The overall challenge comes less from finding out where to go and more from surviving the endurance tests thrown at you to get there. Waltz up into a new town, answer their riddles three, do a dungeon, rinse and repeat. Oh, look at that, you beat the game, wow! While you can beat this without a guide, let's not kid ourselves and act like a pretty penny probably wasn't made off of those strategy guides back in the day. The dungeons are interesting. In the same way that the racist jokes told you by that one family member no one likes at the reunion are interesting. They are long, devoid of enjoyment, and designed to waste your time. If I ever thought in the future, you know what I really want to replay? Final Fantasy 1. I'd immediately follow that up with, Oh wait, Marsh Cave, yeah, no thanks. Now, I told myself I wouldn't play the Dragon Quest card, but there's this thing about the way FF1's designed that really wore me down fast, so I'm gonna do it anyway. In DQ, even in the first game, whenever you die, you're sent back to the last town you visited. Sure, you lose half of your money, but you keep all of your experience. What happens in Final Fantasy 1 when you die? Yeah, you better load your ass back to that previous save, buddy. What, you made it all the way to the end of a dungeon and wiped to one of our enemy's random instant kill moves we threw in there because otherwise they'd be really easy to beat? Fuck you! I don't think I'd have been able to do this without the Pixel Remaster's quicksave feature. Not because Final Fantasy was brutally difficult or anything, it just kinda likes to waste your time. There's no way Square wasn't at least a little inspired by the massive success of Dragon Quest. So it's kind of weird they also focused on big dungeons when their game doesn't really feel designed around them. Dragon Quest dungeons can be long, but those games teach you reloading on death is actually a mistake, because every time you run it back, you're stronger and more prepared. The money loss seems unfortunate, but it's not too big of a loss, as you'll make it back pretty quickly. Have you ever noticed that Dark Souls kinda owes a lot to Dragon Quest? Final Fantasy dungeons exist to be long and challenging in cheap ways, so they aren't really satisfying to beat. I mean, who needs good design when you can just throw in hurt floors? The bosses aren't that strong, they're actually pitiful, but the intended challenge comes from making it to the end with your health and magic high enough to not immediately die to them. Not to mention, I was often punished for exploring in the first place because most of the loot was worse than the gear I already had to get there. If there was an option to be sent back to town on death, at the very least the natural experience gained while exploring would have been a reward in and of itself. I don't want this to sound like Final Fantasy needs to be Dragon Quest. 
but it'll be a while before Final Fantasy really gets how to do a good dungeon. They're passable at best, and I made it through them, but usually they all ended with the same sentiment. Fuck, I'm glad that's over. What do you mean I have to walk all the way back? It's a shame that the dungeons are huge slogs meant to waste your time and resources, because when you're out exploring the world, it comes together rather well. Trust me, I'm not a monster. I do feel bad about going so hard on FF1. It's old, and no one really knew how to make a good RPG until Dragon Quest III came out one month later. Okay, I'll stop now. I had my fun. I'll give Final Fantasy credit where it's due, though. It didn't just popularize the job system, it popularized the concept of the airship. You know what's not fun? Trying to figure out where the hell to go on a boat while constantly getting bombarded by sharks. You know what is fun? Skyboat, baby! No encounters in the air! Let's go! I couldn't help but smile like an idiot. It's awesome that they nailed this legendary moment so well on the first try. That moment when the world completely opens up and you're free to experience the thrill of exploration without getting inked by a squid every five squares? It's amazing! I will say though, I'm not huge on how specific the game is on where you can land. Hope you like parallel parking! So we should talk about the battles, yeah? They are... fine? Props to the enemy variety though. Imagine you just wandering around and then boom, three Draculas! Where the complexity and fun of battles lie isn't in the beat people up with clubs part, but it's supposed to be in the job system. At least, that's how it was intended. The job system in Final Fantasy 1 is pretty rudimentary. You could even argue it started in 3, not 1, but like I alluded to, it had to build off this framework. FF1 is the teenage, part-time job stage of your personal arc with capitalism. At this point, the series was a bit too young and inexperienced to be qualified for anything better than a minimum-waged ice cream job. There's room for promotion, but it's pretty limited and a bit of a letdown when you already put so much work into doing it. And hey, you even have four managers that try to keep you from advancing. Wish me luck in seeing how long I can keep this metaphor going throughout the series. The warrior is our main damage dealer and can take quite a beating. They're pretty overpowered, and unless you're running a challenge playthrough, you pretty much need one in your party. Even if he starts off as an adorable little dude. I mean, look at him, he's so cute. The monk is... eh? Look, don't fall for the monk grift. If I had one regret, it would be Skrungus. Monks are unique for their barehanded brawler perk, making them stronger in battle with no equipment. It certainly makes them easy to buy gear for, because you don't. But in my experience, their damage output just isn't good enough to make up for all the cons. Skrungus floor tanked better than anyone during my endgame, getting dumpstered by any boss that cast a little magic spittle his way. Which was... very annoying. Just pick a thief or red mage, you'll thank me later. And last, but certainly not least, were the final two jobs, which were the traditional mages, white and black. They start simple enough, your stock healer mage and a damage dealer mage, but they both end up being able to cast some serious damage late game, and their buffs are pretty essential. They can't do too much physical damage, but we can let Jack do the killing. I don't give a fuck who you are! An important staple of the job system are the promotions, and in this one, they're off the beaten path. Each of the jobs has a linear progression path. Warriors turn into knights, monks to masters, white and black mages to white and black wizards. Go through a dungeon, get a thing, enter the dragon hole, and then you're ready to grow up. Ah, just like real life. All right, Bahamut. What do you got for me? Oh god, you made them all ugly! Yeah, uh, a nitpick about the Pixar remaster. I'm not a big fan of the second form sprites. They're supposed to look like the NES sprites, but I think they look worse. Can't believe what they did to my adorable warrior boy Jack! Craig, you buffed him too much! I feel like it's a serious missed opportunity for the knight promotion to not have a unique sprite. Maybe in the vein of the famous Amano Warrior of Light art. I mean, Firion in the NES version of FF2 was just a copy and pasted warrior, and he got a unique sprite. So what gives? 
The party synergy in battle before and after class progression didn't matter too much in my experience the further I got in the game. Well balanced is not the phrase I'd use to describe FF1, so naturally you end up finding and abusing an optimal strategy, causing you not to experiment too much. Normal encounters? Hit the death button. Fighting a boss? Haste your warrior? Hit the death button. What makes FF1 stand out though, at least in the version I played, is the spell charge system. There's no MP, but instead you get a set amount of spells you can do for each level of magic. I think this is a D&D &D thing. My experience with D&D &D begins and ends at watching video essays on how cool Baldur's Gate is, so I'm not the best to speak on that. I don't really think this is too different from MP in actuality, but there are certainly benefits. I really enjoyed that I could use my lower level spells to get me through a dungeon and then stock up my more powerful ones for when I either fought the boss or got into a pinch. All in all, the gameplay of FF1 is okay. The story on the other hand, well, there's not too much of it, which is why I haven't really talked about it too much up till now, but what is there is cool, even if it lacks any real thematic depth. You learn about the setting from the king, get exposition dumps from these 12 old dudes totally not in a cult, learn about the state of the world from the NPCs, and then... Oh shit, time travel! That's right, when you beat the four fiends, you're not done yet. You have to head back to Chaos Shrine. It turns out there's a lot more going on than what meets the eye. Here we are, the moment we've been waiting for all game. It's time to face off against Chaos. But first, go through a buffed up version of the Chaos Shrine, defeat the four fiends again, fight a million random encounters, and then get ready to finally kill Chaos. Oh, but what's this? Our old pal Garland. So, the Garland who jobbed hard in the beginning of the game was sent back in time 2000 years by the fiends, who then were sent to the present. From what I can tell, the plan seems to be that in 2000 years, Garland is going to do a ton of push-ups while listening to Limp Biscuit to get real strong, and then keep the cycle going forever to be unbeatable. You know, kind of like that infinite chocolate trick that got popular years ago. Naturally, as heroes, your response is... Garland, always one to hate an awkward silence, turns into chaos, and now it's time for the final fight. You know, I'd probably have praised this fight for actually asking me to engage with the game's mechanics if they didn't give him a full heal at random. Real dick move, Jack. Keep on the tried and true heal, buff, and revive pattern until you win. This fight kind of sucks, but the song owns, and I'll admit I had the closest feeling to what I'd call fun while fighting it compared to any of the other bosses, so that has to stand for something. Once chaos is defeated, the cycle is broken and peace is restored to the world. Simple from start to finish, but despite that simplicity, it's hard not to respect Final Fantasy 1. It created a lot from nothing, from a team who'd never made an RPG like this before, and that's saying something. Now, is it the best Final Fantasy game? Of course not, that's not even asking the right question. Besides, we all know the answer to that question. Obviously it's Final Fantasy 2. There is value in playing FF1 though, if only to say you did it. The Pixel Remaster does as much as it can to round out the edges, and is probably the best way to play today, in my opinion. But honestly, if you're gonna play this game, just pick whichever one you think has the best art style. They're all different flavors of FF1, and if it interests you, then hey, go for it. I do wish the job system had more going on here, but that doesn't mean we wasted this first episode. Everything that follows builds off of FF1. These humble beginnings are admirable, and its combat isn't without value. Self-imposed challenge runs are a great fit for this game, given the natural class restrictions. Want to do a playthrough that's just four warriors? Call that a jackbox. Obviously, Square realized they had something here, so they weren't going to drop the job system. They would just need a bit of time to experiment before coming back to it. 
They'd then take the feedback from both FF1 and probably the soon to be released Dragon Quest 3 and use it to end the Famicom era with one last hurrah. But that is for another day. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. This video would not be possible without the following individuals. The biggest thanks I have to give is to Zanchil for handling editing for this one. The reason why the turnaround time for this was so fast is because she is incredible. So if you notice, wow, this has some neat little editing things that you usually don't have, Cullen. It's because she's great. Next is Zerker, as always, for helping me edit the script. Thank you to at me be underscore abo for the theme song you're hearing right now. And the two people who did voiceover work for me were GC Vasquez as the king and at V over Nate over on Twitter for doing the totally not slanderous Sakaguchi quote. Please go support and follow all of them on Twitter. But none of this would be possible without our wonderful backers over on Patreon. Those are the names you're seeing right now. If you want your name in the credits, get to see videos early, get video scripts, and even get a vocal shout out, the Patreon link is in the description of this video, so check it out. This month's Metal Royal Slimes are Alex Austin, Autumn Jennings, Courtney Littleton, Enora Van, Virion's Nipples, Happy Emmons, Horn Curling, I, Frozen Ace, Jeremy DeForest, Moon Watcher, Pinhead, Nathan, Pyre, Key Version, Sniggs, and last but certainly not least, Wayne is Boss. Thanks again to everyone I just mentioned, and to you for watching. And yes, Chrono Cross next. Stay safe out there everyone, bye bye!